climate is about everything. It is. It's about black holes, the way people chew gum, the fad for false eyelashes. If not, then the phrase climate is about everything is meaningless. But I look forward to seeing where this logic is going. Oh, and stick around for later in the video when Peterson argues the complete opposite. Okay. But your models aren't based on everything. Your models. Okay, so Peterson is talking about researchers who make climate models. Got it. And he's right. Their models aren't based on everything because black holes, chewing gum and false eyelashes don't need to be factored into climate models for reasons I hope I don't need to explain. A model is just an explanation of how something works in nature, quantifying the factors, the variables that affect it. When a model is proved to be in line with observations, scientists end up being able to predict what will happen when these variables change, whether it's CO2 concentration affecting temperature, or the effect of the moon on tides, or the position of a piston affecting mileage in a car. But let's give Jordan Peterson a bit more rope and see what it is about this he doesn't get. Your models are based on Warming. a set number of variables. Yeah. That's right. This is Physics 101. Each scientific model is based on a set number of variables. Well, how did you decide which set of variables to include in the equation? Oh, dear. Well, let's start with an obvious fact. Researchers don't decide the variables that govern a natural phenomenon. Nature decides. Researchers simply discover or identify these variables. It's a foundation of science going back 500 years that's still taught in elementary school with this experiment. Peterson fans can try this at home to work out which variables affect the time of a pendulum swing. Start with a list of all the possible variables that are likely to affect the swing of the pendulum. And here's a hint. You don't need to include everything from the GDP of China to the size of your mattress because that's something only an idiot would contemplate doing. Now, if you vary something like the angle at which you let go of the pendulum and it doesn't affect the time of the swing, then you can cross that one out. Eventually, you'll be left with the variables that do affect the swing. You've identified them, and you can quantify them and show their relationship, accurately predicting the time of the pendulum for a given change in the variables. That's called a model. Even then, other researchers may find that the results are out by a tiny amount, which means the model needs refining. Rival research teams then experiment further until they find a variable that was missed. Over time, the model gets more and more accurate. The system of identifying variables has been refined and codified over 500 years, so now you can learn about how to do it in YouTube videos. Of course, critics, people who like to call themselves climate skeptics, could argue that a pendulum swing and the movement of tides and planets are easy to model, whereas something like the Earth's temperature is incredibly complicated and therefore impossible. But that's only because you've learned about simplified versions of these models if you reached 8th grade science. At PhD level physics, they get much harder. The Newtonian model of gravitational attraction has been refined by Einstein's general theory of relativity. Even something as simple as the swing of a pendulum and tidal movements are incredibly difficult to model. The reason these things can be accurately predicted is because they are not impossible as long as you've been educated in the subject and understand it. Likewise, a model of the Earth's energy budget can be very easy to understand, using just a few variables that make the model pretty accurate, or you can go to PhD level and refine the model to a high degree of accuracy, to a level that makes it seem impossible to the average, say, psychologist TV star. Look, this is no slur on the critics. I'm sure they're very well educated in their own fields, just as Peterson is. But you can't say this model is right because you think you understand it, and this model is wrong because it's too complicated for you to understand. The problem is Peterson doesn't even try to understand it. Well, how did you decide which set of variables to include in the equation? He never asks an expert how they decide which variables to include in their equations even though he sat down with a couple of sympathetic climate scientists who could have told him. Neither did he dare ask them why they don't include everything in their models. 
I'm guessing he knows that they would see these questions as the utterings of a simpleton, because even psychologists should know how variables are identified and that the number is finite. So instead of asking someone who can give the answers, he plays dumb to a dumb audience and asks Joe Rogan. Unfortunately for Peterson, Rogan then asks a simple, innocent question, and the whole conspiracy theory unravels. What do you mean by everything when you say... Well, when, but that's, what, that's what people who talk about the climate apocalypse claim in some sense. We have to change everything. Wait, what? What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Now, if you're a Peterson fan who missed the insanely idiotic thing he just said, here it is spelled out. Peterson is pointing out that some apocalypse advocates believe we have to change everything. Well, that's a political issue. Therefore, Peterson thinks these people must believe that climate is everything. In some sense. In some sense. And if that's what they believe, then researchers ought to include their beliefs into climate models. But researchers, quite rightly, don't factor the political beliefs of fringe groups into their models, because politics has nothing to do with science. So what happened to the famous, science can only thrive in the absence of a political agenda? I guess that goes out the window when the political agenda serves your purposes. But clearly, this is not how science is done. I mean, if that's the argument, then you could make the same argument about anything, like gravity. It keeps our feet on Earth, it weighs down the atmosphere so we can breathe, it even holds the galaxy together. Put like that, the average crowd in a pub will say, gravity's everything. So if people think gravity's everything, then physicists should include everything in their model of gravitational attraction. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Peterson was so badly caught out by his own idiotic explanation that he started to backtrack. Like when you say everything, in a sense, that's meaningless, right? What? Yes, but you were the one saying everything, and you're the one saying everything needs to go into these climate models. No one else is saying that. To all the Peterson fans who think the only reason he sounds like a complete imbecile is because I've doctored the video or changed what he said, no, it's all in chronological order and the interview is linked in the video description for you to verify. So if you think he sounds like an imbecile and you've ruled out malicious editing or AI, well, the only explanation is that you're staring at something you may not have considered before. Reality. Less than a minute after admitting that the climate is everything claim is meaningless and didn't come from scientists, Peterson slips back into reinstating his bizarre earlier claim and once again pinning it on climate researchers. If it's about everything, your models aren't right. OK, a couple of things. First, we've established that in terms of scientific model, it isn't about everything. It's something you made up because some people want to change everything and you've admitted that it's meaningless. We really don't need to say much more than that. Second, we know the models are right, because over the last 40 years they've been proved to be right. They predicted average global temperature with a high degree of accuracy, and over time, as with all models, they've got even more accurate. And that's one reason we know that researchers have identified the right variables and quantified them correctly. The irony is that if physicists were as bad at identifying variables as Peterson claims, then Peterson wouldn't be talking into a camera lens and broadcasting his lack of knowledge to millions of people. Rogan wouldn't have a microphone, or an engine for his car, or metal to make the engine, or gasoline to run it. All of these things have depended on scientific models, past experiments that have quantified the variables that go into moving streams of electrons, keeping satellites in orbit, and calculating the location of oil deposits. To be fair, Peterson has invented a few things himself. Not being a scientist or someone who understands variables, his inventions are a bit more on the touchy-feely side, aphorisms rather than equations. To tell the truth, or at least don't lie. Yeah. Right. Do what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Wow, so deep. These aphorisms may not be able to accomplish what science has done, power your car or communicate across continents or shrink a brain tumour, 
But without them, how would we ever have known that it's a bad idea to lie or that resentment is one of the deadliest emotions? Peterson has a stack of these aphorisms on his Twitter feed, and I guess because they're included in the concept of everything, he'd say they need to be factored into climate models. <laughs> Who knows? By the way, here are some of Peterson's words of wisdom mixed in with some of my own. So just for fun, let's see how easy it is to tell the difference. Guess which ones of Peterson's brilliant insights which make him the most influential public intellectual in the Western world right now. And which are just some old crap I made up in less than two minutes. Answers later in the video. Anyway, back to the point. Having argued that scientists should put everything into their models, would you like to see him now argue the complete opposite? Yeah, thought you would. Then influx of carbon dioxide from the fossil fuel industry into the atmosphere is actually a net ecological good. And the reason I think this is because there's one piece of data that leaps out at me that is so large that it seems to put everything else in the shadow. And that is that in the last 20 years alone, the planet has greened by an area factor of 20%. Okay, so Peterson's theory, his model, is very simple. The increase in greening is caused by an increase in CO2. That's it. CO2 is the only variable in his model. See where this is going? Well, how did you decide which set of variables to include in the equation? Well, that's a very good question, anonymous member of the audience. How did Peterson decide that CO2 concentration must be the only variable in his model? By the way, Peterson's 20% is a percentage, not a factor, and it's nearer 5% over the last 20 years, according to NASA. But I won't contradict Peterson with facts and scientific studies. It's much easier to let him contradict himself. I'm delighted that he accepts that the world is greening because that fits exactly with the climate change model that around 10% of the extra carbon we're adding to the atmosphere will go into plant growth. But why does he say we should look at an infinite number of variables when it comes to measuring the Earth's temperature, but only one variable when it comes to plant growth? After all, a lot of people say vegetation is everything, in some sense. Apart from greening the planet, it's what feeds us. And because there isn't an equal distribution of this vegetation, a lot of people say we have to change everything. But your models aren't based on everything. Yeah, precisely. In the real world, variables are discovered from nature and identified through experiment and calculation. In Peterson world, experimentation and measurement play no part. From the comfort of an armchair, the number of variables is either conjured up to the point of infinity or reduced to just one to best fit the political argument being advanced. It's ironic that Peterson has a video called The Bias in Science. According to studies published by qualified researchers, as opposed to TV personalities sitting in armchairs and thinking they're experts, CO2 is certainly the biggest factor in recent greening, but it's not the only factor. The next biggest is land use changes due to human intervention, such as tree planting, irrigation, fertilizers, farm expansion and erosion protection. Plants are also subject to other variables like rainfall, soil temperature, air temperature, diurnal temperature differences, erosion, flooding, and so on. So what does Peterson say to that? You have to include all these factors. Yeah, thank you again, anonymous member of the audience. And here's a good one for the so-called climate skeptics, who believe whatever they're told by TV stars in armchairs and therefore aren't the least bit skeptical. Climate change may be having negative effects in areas where we grow most of our food, but it's having a very positive effect on spreading forests in the warming Arctic tundra. And that makes up a large percentage of recent greening. So here's the problem for the so-called skeptics. You can't boast that a warmer world is making the Arctic greener without accepting that the world is warming. Now you don't know what the hell to do, do you? When all these other variables are factored in, studies show that CO2 accounts for even less of that increase in global greening over the last 20 years, but the numbers aren't the issue. The point is that Peterson is contradicting himself. That's what happens when you try to paint a picture that's consistent with your beliefs, politics and ideology, rather than science-based reality. Now, back to those aphorisms I showed at the beginning.
Have you been able to spot which ones are mine and which ones are Peterson's? Well, let's fade mine into the background. How did you do? I'm just interested to know if you can see any difference between the BS I conjured up and the stuff that makes Peterson a genius and gives him a comfortable living. There are a lot more dumb claims in the Rogan interview that I just don't have time to cover, so if Peterson fans want to throw up the usual posts like you forgot to mention or you ignored some other piece of BS he spouted, please, please do post it. I know you think it's been left out because he's come up with something so clever that I can't rebut it, but seriously, the best fun I have is when someone is convinced that a piece of BS is absolutely true, and then I make a video tearing it apart. I just don't have room in this one. As we've seen, the best way to demolish Peterson is to show him contradicting himself. So there are only two options. Either Peterson isn't capable of processing data because he doesn't understand how scientific models work, and we take him at his word that he has no idea how variables are, as he calls it, selected. Or he is capable of processing data, and he's deliberately misleading people. I wonder which it is. Maybe he can tell us. My view as a scientist who's capable of assessing data now, remember, unlike Jordan Peterson, I don't make money off my videos. I don't have a Patreon account. I don't monetize them. I just ask that if people would like to support my channel, please support a charity. The website is linked and the donations page is linked if you'd like to give something. But please, when you do donate, could you mention Potholer or Potholer54? Because every now and again, I get a total from the charity telling me how much money they've raised through this channel. And it really is encouraging to see how well you guys have done. I'll try and get a figure for next time and we'll see how we're doing. We're, I think, at the moment close to half a million dollars. Okay, that's it. Cheerio.